Hi, I am Rodney Harrison from the uh, UCL Institute of Archaeology and today we are thinking about the relationship between heritage museums and climate change. So uh, let's begin at the very beginning. Um, what is it, what, what do we mean when we talk about cli climate change or global heating? So climate change uh, refers to long-term shifts in temperature and weather patterns. And what we know is that since the 1800s, human activities have been the main driver of climate change, primarily due to burning fossil fuels like coal, oil and gas. And this is causing global temperatures to rise, resulting in long term changes to climate, including more extreme weather events, rising sea levels and ocean acidification. Uh, and the effects of this is uh, flooding, food insecurity, ecosystem damage, conflict and climate migration. And we can see this here on this graphic showing the uh, changes in annual temperature in the United Kingdom since the late uh, 1800s. And what we now know is that global mean temperature is currently uh, over uh, one degrees higher Celsius than at the start of the Industrial Revolution. And although this sounds like a small amount, it obviously has a massive impact on the planet. And the current aim is to uh, maintain global warming at or below 1.5 degrees Celsius, if, if possible. So what are the threats of global heating to tangible cultural heritage? And when I say tangible cultural heritage, I mean things like buildings and monuments, uh, things that we can touch as opposed to intangible cultural heritage, which is uh, traditions or stories or um, attachments to places, that sort of thing. So, and obviously those two things are, are related to one another, but, um, you know, some of the kind of the great threats that come with global heating to tangible cultural heritage are things like flooding, coastal change, uh, temperature rise and droughts and extreme weather. And there are also indirect, so those are direct threats and there are also indirect th threats to uh, cultural heritage like conflict that might arise due to food insecurity, that sort of thing. So an example here we can see, uh, this is Hearst castle, uh, which was originally built by Tudor King Henry VIII between 1541 and 1544. And last year in 2021, a section of Hearst Castle's east wing collapsed into the sea, which you can see here on the screen, um, after its foundations were eroded due to uh, sea level rise. And as part of efforts to defend the castle, over 5,000 tonnes of granite blocks have been um, put in place to form a barrier or a revetment here um, to stop the impact of the sea uh, continuing to erode the castle. And this is one of a series of coastal castles that English heritage have uh, indicated are at risk uh, because of sea level rise. So thinking about uh, natural heritage, global heating is obviously um, also a threat to natural heritage. Um, uh, more frequent and intense droughts, storms, heat waves, rising sea levels, melting glaciers and warming oceans can directly harm plants and animals and destroy the places in which they live. And this can lead to things like species extinction or multiply the levels of threat to species that are already threatened by human impacts. And um, one of the problems here is that there is a sort of uh, a cycle that um, uh, sort of occurs where when you have destructions of ecosystems that undermines nature's ability to help to regulate greenhouse gas emissions and protect against extreme weather. And this then accelerates climate change and, and uh, the increasing vulnerability of nature to climate change. Um, and this is why we have things like the Bond Challenge, which is um, a, a sort of challenge to uh, reforest 30% uh, of the forests in the world that are in the most important places for helping to maintain climate change um, at uh, 1.5 degrees um, because uh, obviously forests um, uh, have a, a, a really uh, important impact on um, regulating greenhouse gas emissions. And obviously threats to natural heritage also threaten things like traditions and intangible heritage stories, people's attachment to places, um, songs, you know, those sorts of things too. Um, so here is an example of um, 
an impact on natural heritage. This is the uh, Great Barrier Reef, uh, which is a UNESCO World Heritage Site in Australia. Um, and uh, this is uh, now considered to be at risk because of these repeated mass bleaching events that have killed off at least half of the coral in the reef since 1985, uh, due to rising, primarily due to rising sea water temperatures and increased uh, UV levels. Uh, so this is an impact on what we would call in situ heritage, natural heritage, uh, natural heritage that's in its original place. Um, and here we um, have an example of uh, climate change impacts on ex situ heritage or uh, heritage collections that are stored somewhere else. Uh, and this is um, the Svalbard Global Seed Vault. It is a secure backup facility um, that has been built for the world's um, uh, crop biodiversity. Uh, on the Norwegian island of Spitsbergen in the remote Arctic Svalbard archipelago. And the seed vault provides long-term storage of duplicates of seeds conserved in gene banks around the world. Uh, this aims to provide security for the world's uh, food supply against the loss of seeds in gene banks due to mismanagement, accident, equipment failures, funding cuts, war, sabotage, disease, and other sorts of natural disasters. And pre preserving cop crop biodiversity in the event of climate change or disease, rendering certain kinds of crop foods unviable in the future, uh, and thus aims to maintain crop genetic diversity, um, but also to maintain th things that are called wild relatives of crops, like wild rices, barleys, wheat seeds, etc. And uh, these are conserved in the case that um, climate change uh, makes existing crops, existing forms of barley and wheat um, unsustainable in the different locations in which they are currently uh, being grown. And um, so this was opened in, in 2008 in a location where there was year round permafrost. Um, and it, it was opened here because it felt that it would be easier to maintain the minus 18 degrees Celsius temperatures that are required. Um, and that in the event of a, um, power shortages, for example, that it would uh, maintain that, that it would keep the, the seeds cold. Um, but less than 10 years after it opened, actually, due to global warming, the per permafrost in this area has begun to melt in the summers. And uh, in, I think, about 2018, um, the permafrost melted and flooded the entrance hall of the vault, and then it refroze, and it damaged the whole uh, front entrance of this facility. Um, which required then significant repairs. So even these secure facilities and initiatives that are intended to secure biodiversity into the future uh, in the face of climate change can themselves be put at risk due to global heating. Um, so one of the uh, things about uh, the sort of challenge for heritage in climate change is that it, there will be inevitable losses, particularly of, of uh, forms of coastal heritage like the uh, Hearst Castle that we were just looking at. And, you know, one of the one of the things, one of the opportunities, I guess, that climate change has created is is for us to begin to think a little bit more creatively about uh, how do we deal with um, forms of heritage which will be inevitably lost and how do we learn to lose those well. And I think this is a really brilliant example. This is um, a project called the Foghorn Requiem which is a piece of music that was written to um, mourn the loss of the sound of the foghorn from the uh, British coastal landscape. It's um, a piece of music that was composed for orchestra, uh, for 50 boats at sea, and for the um, Sota Lighthouse foghorn itself. Uh, and it's a project that was um, designed by artists uh, Lisa Altagena and Josh Portway. So I'm going to play you a little bit of film now from this um, kind of amazing project.
OK, so I'll stop there. You, you get the idea. But um, so I think, you know, the, the thing about climate change is um, I think that it really does force us as uh, heritage professionals and researchers to think about ways of doing things differently when when uh, we know that um, lighthouses will fall into the sea, coastal castles will also be uh, eroded to the point where they can no longer be maintained. So how do we um, provide ways of valuing and mourning the loss of things that uh, we see as significant uh, in the landscape? Uh, so yeah, beginning to think about um, global heating as also an opportunity to, to think differently and to do things differently.
So um, I want to move on now to think about the role of heritage institutions and museums and how they fit into global frameworks such as the, the Paris Agreement, Paris Climate Agreement, and the United Nations Framework Convention on, on Climate Change. So um, both the, the Paris Agreement and the, the Framework Convention on Climate Change recognize the importance of uh, education, public awareness, training, public participation, public access to information and international cooperation in facilitating action for climate empowerment. Um, and this, this area, these six, six uh, sort of threads uh, um, are known in the um, Framework Convention as, as action for climate empowerment. And um, action for climate empowerment specifically mentions museums and other cultural institutions, uh, and actually also universities as key uh, organizations to deliver on action for climate empowerment. And um, last year, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about this in a minute. Um, I participated in uh, COP26, which was held in Glasgow, which is the Conference of the Parties, the uh, United Nations Climate Change Conference that happens every year. Um, and uh, we participated in, in a range of the discussions around action for climate empowerment, at which a new 10-year framework called the Glasgow Work uh, Package on Action for Climate Empowerment was agreed. And it again reiterated the importance of museums and other forms of heritage in, in delivering on the, um, these six areas. So um, we wanted to design a project which would help to um, explore the role of museums in delivering on action for climate empowerment. And so uh, in 2020, on International Museums Day, we announced this um, open call for a design and ideas competition called Reimagining Museums for Climate Action. Uh, and responding to these, the two main pillars of climate action, mitigation and adaptation, the competition asked how museums could help society to make the deep transformative changes needed to achieve a net zero or zero carbon world. And rather than focusing on a, a specific location or type of museum, the competition invited proposals that aimed to unsettle and subvert the very foundations of museological thinking to support and encourage meaningful climate action. And we specifically asked for design and concept proposals that were radically different from the traditional museum or that explored new ways for traditional museums to operate. And the responses could address any aspect of museum design or activity and, and ranging from the fantastical to the highly practical. And we worked with uh, an international team of judges after the competition closed on the 15th of September uh, and attracted over 500 expressions of interest and more than 250 formal submissions from almost 50 different countries. And we worked with the Glasgow Science Centre, which was to be the host of uh, COP26, and our team of international judges to invite eight teams to develop their proposals for an exhibition to be held uh, inside the official green zone for COP26 uh, in November 2021. And here you can see some of the, the original submissions that we received uh, from a number of different countries. Uh, one for a, a sort of museum proposal, this one for what became a film um, narrated by Donna Haraway. Uh, and this also um, relates to what became a film, but this is a, a sort of reworking of the uh, 26 UN, uh, the, the, the museum definition that was discussed at the International Council of Museums Conference uh, the year before COP26. And here is a, a slide of what became the exhibition. So we had these eight exhibits and a, and, and a sort of um, an overarching sort of thematic uh, starting point for the eight that were dotted about the, the, uh, the top floor of the Glasgow Science Centre. Um, each of the exhibits sort of asked a provocative question um, and uh, developed that theme. So you can see some of these here. Uh, and the exhibition featured proposals from Brazil, Indonesia, Singapore, the United States and the United Kingdom, uh, ranging from interactive models to concept designs to apps and short films. 
including the short film Elephant in the Room, which was produced by Design Earth and featuring Donna Haraway as its narrator. And the global scope of these proposals shows that museums have uh, a significant role to play in addressing climate change at an international level, tailored to their local context and the ambition from both outside as well as within the sector to reimagine museums to address complex contemporary problems. So some more uh, images of the exhibition. Um, and the exhibition itself was then accompanied by, this is our um, website, you can have a look if you like, at museumsforclimateaction.org. Um, it also includes a, a toolkit for museums and a, a book which you can download for free. Um, and so the, the exhibition was accompanied by a series of events and activities, both online and, and in person. We ran a number of side events in the Blue Zone during COP26. We launched our Museums and Climate Action Toolkit. Um, and uh, we've been running a series of national and international workshops to promote and encourage practitioners to use the toolkit with museums this year. So here we can see the Glasgow Science Centre when it was taken over by the Green Zone. And um, this is um, some of the activities that we were running inside the Green Zone around the exhibition, asking people for their own views on how museums could change to facilitate them taking the forms of climate action that they wish to take. And this is a view from the green zone inside the exhibition to the blue zone where the actual official part of COP take, was taking place uh, last year uh, during COP26. So um, I wanted to end on an important point which has emerged really over the past decade, which is the significant link between colonialism and the climate emergency. And the sort of interconnections became particularly apparent over the summer of 2020 during the pandemic with the murder of George, George Floyd and the acceleration of Black Lives Matter protests, identifying museums and statu statues related to the slave trade as targets for protest. So the link between colonialism and climate is not only because uh, global majority peoples are more vulnerable to climate change, um, but because the idea of human dominion over nature and racialized hierarchies were themselves in many cases developed historically in and alongside colonial museums. So this year, for the first time in its 34 year history, the uh, International Panel on Climate Change, uh, the IPCC, uh, explicitly identified the role of racism and colonialism as a contributing factor to the vulnerability of certain people and landscapes to climate change. So efforts to become more climate active and decarbonize must necessarily go hand in hand with efforts to examine the colonial origins of those institutions and attempts to address their roles in those regards. And so we see, for example, uh, the group BP or not BP here protesting at the uh, British Museum about BP's, uh, uh, about the British Museum's ongoing sponsorship of its exhibitions by BP as a form of fossil fuel greenwashing and challenging, very much challenging this sponsorship but also drawing attention to the need to repatriate cultural objects taken from countries of origin and highlighting the links between fossil fuel extractivism and cultural extractivism. So just to quickly sum up, uh, we spoke about global warming as a threat to both cultural and natural heritage, but also as an opportunity to think about doing heritage differently. Uh, we've considered the importance of institutions facilitating action for climate empowerment and have looked at the example of this uh, design competition and exhibition that we ran um, to help facilitate that. And um, we've talked about the necessary connection between decolonization and decarbonization in relation to engaging with uh, uh, taking action for climate. So I hope you've enjoyed this lecture um, and I hope that uh, if you're interested, that you'll get in contact or um, look in more detail at our BA Heritage degree program. Thank you.